Hello and welcome. As always, I'm Judge Zed, a.k.a. Zacharias the Pious of House Lane, first of his name, former Lord of Give a Shit a Sheer, Harbinger of Sass, and Holy Prince of the Sea of Ash, and Lord of the Game. And today that game is the only game whose maze craze plays for days in ways that will amaze days and set characters ablaze. Dungeon Crawl Classics. Now, if you've been watching me for a while, you know I'm a complete fanatic of this game. And uh, today I'd like to just do a quick read-through of the quick start rules for Dungeon Crawl Classics. Give you all a idea of how the game is played and, and give you all a, just a walkthrough of, of the quick start rules for this game. Now the uh, real rules are very expansive. I think they're about... Uh, 500 something pages long uh we're not gonna go that we're not gonna go there today uh we're just gonna do a quick just a quick run through of my personal favorite fantasy role-playing game and maybe my favorite role-playing game of all time i've been playing for a hot minute now um so yeah let's scroll past this beautiful doug kovacs cover uh and go into the uh the front page here you know, you get a even more excellent artwork from Kovacs, uh, introducing you to the the road crew, which I, I'm sure I'll talk about at some point. And then these are the uh, level zero character sheets, a very slim down version. This is two full character sheets right here uh, for your uh, photocopying pleasure. And then we have just another full page, Peter Mullen. Uh, I believe I'm getting the first name right there. Uh, art piece here just a, a piece of artwork really full page really giving you an idea of what this is all about it's all about the dinosaurs it's all about the tentacles it's all about the eye stocks and the, the wizards and the, the demons and the cults and the oh uh, it's the fantasy game you've always wanted and look there you are getting ready to save everyone maybe so we're gonna scroll all the way oh uh-oh here we are. The very beginning. The best place to start. You are no hero. You're an adventurer. A reaver. A cut purse. A heathen slayer. A tight-lipped warlock guarding long-dead secrets. You seek gold and glory. Winning it with sword and spell. Caked in the blood and filth of the weak. The dark the demons, and the vanquished. There are treasures to be won deep underneath, and you shall have them. These are the opening words to this role-playing game, and I think they ring true. It's very much, uh... It's a darker take. It's not quite as dark as, as your lamentations of your flame princesses, uh, but it is, it's a, it's pretty dark. It's, it's dark enough for me, honestly. Uh, you know, and I still drink my espresso with a little bit of cream in there to give you an idea how I like my fantasy world. Uh, DCC starter rules. These rules were written specifically to introduce judges and players to the DCC RPG system. In some areas, they have been condensed and simplified. These rules will serve primarily to get characters through the first level zero adventure and their first level one adventure. Although the rules go up to level two, you won't have the full play experience until you buy the core rulebook. This starter document should be enough for you to realize how much fun the game is. For the full DCC experience and play at levels up to 10th, please refer to the Dungeon Crawl Classic RPG rulebook, which, again, I highly recommend here. I have it. I have two copies of it. Uh, they're signed. They're big. They smell good. They look good. They even taste good. No, I don't taste it. Not on, not on stream. Love this book. Uh, it does not come tabbed. I tab my own copy because I use it so much. I uh, blew the I blew the spine out of the, the copy I had originally when I met Joseph Goodman. He said, uh, "Oh my goodness, you must have been playing this game since it first came out. This book is is torn to shit." And I was like, "Nah, I've been playing for like a year. <laughs> I just have played, you know, multiple times a week, uh, every week since I first bought this rule book uh, over a year ago. <laughs> um, it's an amazing game. But let's do um." 
the core mechanic here and the dice chain without completely goofing everything up can we do it here we are Ooh, there we are the core mechanic in DCC RPG is the d20 roll you will frequently be asked to roll one d20 and add or subtract modifiers the goal is to roll high and beat a DC. This means difficulty class. Sometimes the DC will have specific terms such as an armor class or AC, which is a combat variety of a DC. Uh, a higher DC is a more is more difficult to beat and a better armor creature is a higher AC. So what this means is if Let's, okay, let's use two quick examples out of combat. You're trying to jump over a gap. If it's a tiny little gap, if it's like this, and you just kind of step over it, well then, as long as your character's not blindly running down the alley, you, you, you step over it, it's fine. Now, if it's, say, this big, and you gotta do a little hop, then that's, it's child's play, you know? It's a DC-5. Now, if you got a, a big old chasm you got to jump across, and you got like a running start, I'm, it still might be like a DC 17, uh, but you know you can. It's still possible. It's very high difficulty. Armor class, same way. You got a kobold uh, who's like really slow, and he's you know no armor. You got DC like seven or an eight. Now you got a fully. You're, you got your Conan the Barbarian with no armor. But he's super fast. He doesn't need armor. Armor just slows him down. Uh, then you got like a DC 14, 15, right? Uh, you got a warrior in full plate who like knows how to use it and is super, super strong. You might have a 22, uh, an 18, 19, like who knows? Uh, but it's all situational and it's up to the judge to determine this. Now, if you roll equal to or higher than the DC or AC, you succeed. Otherwise, you fail. Uh, a roll of one is always an automatic failure and often res results in a fumble uh, in a fumbling failure of some kind. So in this game, if you roll a one, there's a table you roll on if it's in combat uh, and you roll a specific kind of fumble. Now, if you're out of combat, this is a point of contention for some, uh, how the critical and fumble function is going to be up to, it's a judge by judge basis, uh, but Traditionally, it's at the very minimum an automatic success or an automatic failure. 5% chance uh, on the d20 roll. I don't think it's too, too much. Uh, and if it doesn't make narrative sense, then come up with come up with something that narratively does make sense. It's your job as the, the person running the game. Um, a roll of a 20 is an automatic hit and often results in a critical success of some kind. And this is going to send you to a critical table. Uh, in combat corresponding to your class and level uh, and it will cause a bonus effect oftentimes dealing extra damage or blinding stunning pushing back uh, gelding your opponent in, some, <laughs> in one way or another uh, occasionally a character may roll a die other than a d20 when acting such as a d16 a d24 or even a d30 are used for weaker or stronger warriors and spellcasters. Now, this is the core mechanic of DCC, and what sets it apart from other role-playing games is the dice chain. One of the most fun aspects of using funky dice is getting to roll those dice. Many traditional RPGs utilize modifiers to dice rolls as a way to express improved success or failure in an action. For example, an attack with an offhand weapon may incur a minus four penalty. Pretty standard D&D stuff, even way back in the 3.5 days uh, when I started playing. DCC RPG utilizes this traditional modifier system, but also employs a system of swapping out die types. Although a D20 is the core die mechanic of the game, there are times when the player may be instructed to roll a D16 or a D24 instead, depending on whether the action has an improved or reduced chance of success. The system for moving up and down different die types is known as the die chain. The dice chain is represented as follows. So, if you're if you're jumping in here and you're familiar with everybody's favorite role-playing game that uses a seven polyhedral dice set, 
then you are familiar with seven of these and not all 14 of them. So I'm going to run through the full 14 dice set, uh, and I will, like, hold a finger up when it's a dice that's otherwise normally just used in D&D. &D. A D3, a D4, a D5, a D6, a D7, a D8, a D10, a D12, a D14, a D16, a D20, a 24, and a 30. I missed one somewhere because I'm only got i holding up six fingers. I don't know. Oh, it's I think it's the other percentile dice. Yes, it is uh, the other D10. Every dice set usually comes with a second D10 so you can roll a D100. Um, personally, I like to roll a 100-sided die, but we will talk about that at a different time. It's not this video. Whenever the rules specify a bonus of 1D, the die to be rolled moves up one step to the right on the chain, culminating in a D30, the largest die that can be used. When the rules specify a penalty of minus 1D, the die to be rolled moves one step to the left, culminating in a D3, the smallest die that can be used. Multiple steps can switch the die type. Two or more steps come and combined improvements and reduced results can offset one another. Modifiers to the rule, such as what plus one or plus or minus two, are applied to the result of the new die type. So it does. It just changes what type of die you roll uh, instead of applying additional modifiers. So a, a great example of this in combat is a thief on a roof firing down into an alley while it's raining. Now. In D&D, &D, we got darkness, we got uh, the rain, we got, uh, you, you have advantage because you're up above the enemy, you have the high ground, uh, maybe you're sneaky. There's so, there's so many things that are going on in this one action that I'm going to need to look in multiple sections of the book to make sure that I'm going to rule this the same for you as I would rule it the same for somebody else. In DCC, it's going to be, it's, we're faster and looser than that. We want the action to keep going, so I'm going to say uh, you're... You have the high ground, so you're plus 1D. Uh, it's raining, that's going to be minus 1D, so you're still out of D20. Um, those, yeah, those both offset each other, but you're, you're firing into, into darkness, so you're going to be at a minus 2. Uh, what, have, what have you got for me as far as bonuses go? I'm just going to say, I, I at that point in my mind, if I'm going to put a minus 2 onto the player, I will more often than not as a judge just add that to the DC. I'm not, I don't want you, the player, I just give me your, you give me your number, I'll set the DC. You know, I don't want to add more, more math to you. You've got enough math. You're, you're probably got some variable dice bonuses and, and whatnot of your own to, to deal with, you know? Um, so how is this game different from what you've played before? If you're coming here and you've played 3.5, 3.0, maybe even 4.0 or 5, uh, of everyone's favorite role-playing game, Dungeons and Dragons, um, then let's talk about that. Uh, DCC RPG does not have prestige classes. Uh, it says it doesn't have attacks of opportunity, but that's not, it's not true. It's in the rules. <laughs> it's in the rules somewhere. I had a player bring that up at a convention. Uh, I, I took that as, uh, so, all right, and I'll bring, I'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, it doesn't have feats and it doesn't have skill points. It doesn't really even have skills in the same sense of that you're used to. Uh, classes and race are one and the same. You are a wizard or you are an elf pretty simple um and i do want to talk briefly about attacks of opportunity there are rules in the combat section for uh trying to leave combat when you're already engaged and your opponent getting an attack against you with a plus one when you try to do that this is because this game like i said it's fast and it's loose it's whatever works in the situation that you rule it works in as the dungeon master as the judge as the referee, as the game master, whatever you want to call yourself, whatever whatever title you want to go by, it's on you to keep it going. So keep it going. That's just kind of what the way the rules are. It says no attacks of opportunity. Later on, it says there are. Why? Because it's your call whether or not there are attacks of opportunity. Your players may point to a thing in the book, but you might say, like, look, in this situation, I would say it doesn't really count. Or whatever. Or whatever you want to say. Let's keep moving. If you're familiar with various iterations of AD&D, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which is the version of Dungeons and Dragons that was that came before 3rd edition, for those of you who are here as a uh, 101 crash course in role playing, 
DCC RPG uses an ascending armor class system. Normal unarmored peasant is AC 10, while a warrior in plate mail is AC 18. So if you're coming in here and you're from the old guard, if you used a descending armor class, Thacko, two hit armor class equals zero. If you use those tables, forget, forget what you've learned. And we now use this new armor class system in which the armor class functions the same as the difficulty class basically it's just it they both go up in difficulty instead of coming down in difficulty uh it streamlines everything in the mind of the judge and and in the minds of the players too although i do understand and i have had players at my own tables who really struggle with um forgetting thacko and moving on to the ascending armor class system uh attack saves and skill checks all involving all involve rolling a d20, adding modifiers, and trying to beat a number. Uh, they've really reduced the amount of percentile dies uh, and other dies that are rolled um, during the game. It, it basically, it's all going to function the same as uh, attacking and combat did in AD&D where you're rolling the d20. Um, there are three saving throws, which is new to this third edition. Uh, in And if you're playing fifth edition, I'll kind of try to update this for that as well. Uh, every attribute has a save. That is no longer the case here. We have fortitude, reflex, and will. They're based on stamina, agility, and personality, respectively. Now, no matter what edition you've played before, here's some stuff that is important. Yeah. Bah. There we go. Clerics turn creatures that are unholy to their religion. This may include undead and other creatures. So if you're a uh, cleric of the goddess of nature, who is going to take, you know, it's going to take part in my current campaign in Black Marsh, you can turn regular old animals, just regular mundane forest creatures. You could turn them as if they were undead and you were a cleric in another edition of the game. It's very, very cool. All spells are cast with a spell check where the caster rolls a d20, adds certain modifiers, and tries to score high. The higher the roll, the more effective the result. Each spell has a unique chart that adjudicates the spell's result. This is one of the key features that makes high-level DCC players so, so cool and why it's important that people at cons roll, uh, run more than just the funnels. Uh, wizards may or may not lose their spells after casting. A low result means a wizard cannot cast the spell again. I'm sorry, I lost it. Uh, <laughs> that day, on a high result, he can cast the spell again. Cleric's spell casting works differently from wizard casting. Clerics never lose a spell when it's cast. However, when a cleric casts any spell and fails his attempt, he may increase his natural failure range. By the end of the day, clerics may automatically fail on more rolls than just a natural one. So that's what that means. Basically, the, well, what it means is... You're always going to fail. Remember like I said before, a, na uh, a natural 20, a 20 on the die roll, 5% is always a success. A 1 is always a failure. Uh, even if a cleric fails to cast a spell, he doesn't reach the, the DC needed to, to get the spell result that they want. They don't, nothing bad happens unless they get a 1. But every time they fail, the number that they need to roll, like, it, then it becomes a 1 and a 2. Then a, a, a 1 to 3, then a 1 to 4. So it's like the disapproval, it's called disapproval, and it gets bigger with every mistake that that cleric makes. And it can even be added uh, for acting out of alignment. So if you're, you're worshipping the goddess of nature, uh, and you turn some forest creatures to get them away from, uh, you know, this farm, and because uh, you're eating, like, you know, Farm McGregor's berries or whatever, and then you, like, step on a bunny rabbit, and then your god or goddess in this case is just going to be like, all right, I disapprove greatly at plus 10 disapproval. Now, if you try to cast anything and you even remotely mess up, I'm going to come down on you, and you're not going to get to use magic, or you're going to have to, like, do a quest for me. Like, it's, it's all... It's all to fuel the story, to fuel the questing, to fuel the next adventure. Um, there is a critical hit matrix. Higher level characters and martial characters generate critical hits more often and roll on more deadly result tables. Talking about them, crit tables again. Uh, masterpiece. 
You can burn off ability scores to enhance die rolls. All characters can burn luck, which is a new stat, uh, and a Wizards and elves can burn other abilities to fuel their uh, magic. Here's another excellent Mullen illustration. Lord help me, what have I done? Back up to the top. We talked about weird dice. We talked about the strange dice that may appear uh, in this realm. And I'm going to make myself disappear here for a second to make this easier to read for everyone. Uh, this game utilize, utilizes polyhedral dice of unusual specificality, and uh, I'm sorry, of unusual shape, and specifically, uh, it utilizes the standard suite of dice as well as what the author refers to as Zachi dice. That is the proper pronunciation as I have come to understand it. I have met Zachi a couple of times. As an experienced gamer, you undoubtedly own a D4, D6, D10, D12, and D20, as well as probably a, a percentile D10 as well. DCC also makes use of the Zachi dice in the following configurations. D3, D5, D7, D14, D16, D24, and D30. You can purchase these weird dice sets from many online retailers, including Goodman Games, as well as Game Science and Impact Miniatures, uh, most notably. I'm adding that myself. It's not here in the text. You can still roll with regular polyhedral dice. It's easy to substitute the weird dice with a roll uh, with a regular set uh, for a D3 or a D6, divide by two. Uh, you know, it's it just like how, how to substitute the dice. I'll let you go through that one on your own. Um, it's a little it's a little strange, but for the D20, I'll, I'll get to some of these. You can kind of figure it out, like, for for D14 and a D16, you roll the D20 and ignore rolls above the die facing thresholds that you're going for. So if you roll, if you're doing like a D16, you roll an 18, you just re-roll. Uh, for a D24, roll a D12 and a D6. If the six-sided dice is odd, add a 12 to the D12 roll, and so on. Um, so there are ways to do it if you are someone who is stuck using a um, standard polyhedral set for whatever reason. If you're watching this video because it's a let's read and you're you're hard of seeing, it's a little bit difficult for you to read all the text in here and or you're stuck using a braille set of dice and they because they I know that there is a company that makes them and currently they don't make the funky dice in braille uh, and you're stuck using some of these really I gotta admit excellently designed braille dice. I, I took a look at them. Uh, they did a demonstration at my uh, FLGS. Great stuff. Um, if you are using those, there is a way for you to substitute your regular seven polyhedral dice set for the funky dice. Um, it's just a little, it's a little weird. And again, these modifiers, it's not every single roll. It's more often than not, you're just going to use a d20. Like more often than not, you're going to use your regular dice sets, but it does help if you got somebody with the funky dice at the table. Uh, character creation in Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, RPG. Player characters are not created by staying up all night devising a unique and interesting backstory. You roll up zero level untrained and uneducated peasants and you play that unique backstory out in the game. We highly suggest each player roll up multiple level zero characters, at least three, possibly more. I do four. Uh, don't get attached. Characters that survive their first dungeon then choose classes and become worth remembering. The headstones rise to the hills with dead level zero characters. Character creation in DCC follows these steps. Determine ability scores. 3d6 in order for each straight down the line. Note ability modifiers on table 1-1. The abilities are strength, agility, stamina, intelligence, personality, and luck. Personality is a combination of wisdom and charisma if you've played other editions of the game. Luck is an all-new skill which functions as advertised. It's luck, and as stated before, you may burn your luck attribute to increase die rolls on a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, determine hit points. Roll a d4 adjusted by stamina modifier. Determine lucky... So that's right, at level zero you get d4 hit points. Call the commoner, baby. Determine lucky sign. Roll 1d30. Adjusted by luck modifier on table 1-2. Uh, 
the resultant lucky roll modifier associated with that lucky sign is permanent and does not change when luck is spent. Determine level 0 occupation. Roll a D100 on table 1-3. This result will tell the character's le level 0 starting weapon and trade goods. This is very important. Then you choose an alignment. We'll talk about that in a second. Determine starting money. Roll 5D12 copper pieces. You get nothing when you're starting out. You don't know nothing. You don't have nothing. Level 0 characters come with some starting equipment, including occupational weapon, trade goods, and one randomly determined piece of equipment from the table 3-3. Three, three. Uh, level 0 characters may also purchase or barter additional equipment if able. Again, if able. Not every level 0 funnel is going to let you get new equipment before you start. Attempt to survive your first dungeon. If you survive and reach 10 XP, you advance to the first level. At this point, you choose a class. All right, so here are the three tables that were discussed in the previous section of the book, Character Creation. You've got Table 1-1, one, one, the Ability Score Modifiers. Now, this is different from 5th Edition and from 3rd Edition. Uh, this is a much less forgiving Ability uh, Score Modifier table. Uh, you don't get a plus one until, level, until you're at 13, and then you're stuck at a plus one until you're level 16. Then 16, 17, that's a plus 2. And an 18 is a plus 3. That's the max starting out. You can't get better than that. Uh, now, improving abilities beyond starting. Some judges do it, some judges don't. Personally, I do. I have an advanced uh, table that goes beyond eight, uh, 3 to 18. You can go lower, you can go higher. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a different story for a different time. Uh, in this game... Rules is written, you probably won't end up doing that unless you end up in one of the many modules that will cause that to happen. Uh, the next table, table one, two is your luck score. Um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't say luck score, it should say lucky sign, but that's fine. Um, one through D30, you get your birth, auger, and lucky roll. So this is going to, let's just do a quick one. Harsh winter is the first one. Plus one to all attack rolls. That's radical. Um... This is just a this is just a a, a little thing. Uh, each bonus you have, so there's a couple different ways to adjudicate this. I will personally say this is one lucky thing your character's good at. It's a it's a free plus one to one random thing. Now some characters have a bigger modifier to their luck. Let's say you rolled a character with 18 luck. Uh, a character like that is supposed to get a plus three uh and even here down here the wild child number 30 uh says each plus one or minus one is plus five feet or minus five feet to their character speed their movement speed um keep an eye on that you need to decide for yourself what exactly you're gonna do with that um if you're like me i'm not gonna give you if you have a two if you roll a three on your luck and you have a minus three I'm not going to give you minus 15 to your character's movement speed. That doesn't seem fair. Um, but honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like I should start doing that. Uh, and that that should be the way that that functions uh, in my games. And maybe uh, maybe I won't do the uh, that ray of light thing. But we'll worry about that later on. Uh, but again, it's something to think about. Different judges do different things. Finally, your occupation is the most important part. This is basically your character's level zero class. You get an occupation. You get a trained weapon, like a staff, a club, a hammer. Most of it's like clubs and daggers. What have I done? There we go. Uh, and then you get a trade good. Look, the animal trainer gets a pony. The armorer gets an iron helmet. Uh, you get jars of honey if you're the beekeeper, as well as a staff. You get really cool stuff. Uh, stuff that can help you in the adventure. Uh, or stuff you could trade for money to buy stuff to help you in the adventure. It's really up to you how you decide to uh, make that work. And there are a hundred occupations. Next, you get your XP level thresholds. Zero level characters start at zero XP. The indicated level of XP is necessary to achieve each new level. For example, a zero level character becomes a first level warrior when they reach 10 XP. Second level warrior when they reach 50 XP. Third level warrior when they reach 110 XP. 
and so on. And yes, this little table down here, it goes all the way up to level 10. Level 10, you need 1,090 experience points. Now, if you've played a different role-playing game, well, we're actually, we'll talk about why that's a funky thing in here in a second. Weapon training. All level 0 characters are trained in the one weapon they possess from their former occupation. If a level 0 character handles multiple weapons over his career, he is considered trained in the last weapon he fought with. At first level, a character gains training in additional weapons based on the class they choose. Generally, using a weapon without training imposes an attack penalty. However, this penalty is waived for zero-level characters. It is assumed that their naturally poor combat abilities reflect equal incompetence with the martial use of all weapons. And also, if you had these... yeah. So, when they say uh, a penalty, it's usually not listed. Uh, if you try to roll a skill check untrained, uh, you usually roll with a d10. Um, but if you are trying to do, um, a weapon, it can sometimes be more or less depending on what your other martial skills are. If you know how to use a sword, you probably, you're probably not like a day one halberd student. You know, like if you know how to use a long sword, you probably could, you know, within reason swing a battle axe better than someone who doesn't know how to use a sword you know like stuff like that uh and it can all be rules lawyered and adjudicated at the table which is one of the things i love about this game next up trade goods novice adventurers typically hail from mundane backgrounds their economics of a feudal setting involve more barter than coinage a typical farmer or woodcutter may sustain his family for years of trade without ever setting an eye on a metal coin all zero level characters start with trade goods of some kind as indicated on table one three these may be useful in the dungeon or may provide starting point for trading up to a better status in life in addition to their trade goods each level zero character starts with one randomly determined piece of adventuring equipment roll d24 on table three three for each character again we'll get to that table when we get to that table um, I'm going to zoom in here so that we can read about alignment and experience level here. I don't know who did this artwork, but it's great. But let's uh, let's read here of the alignment system. This is very important. This is very different than what you're familiar with if you've played anything other than like old school role playing games. Alignment is a choice of values. In its simplest form, it determines behavior. In higher forms, it determines allegiance to a cosmic force. Characters choose an alignment at level zero, and this choice determines their options for the rest of their lives. I don't always force characters to choose at level zero. Sometimes I let them uh, wait till they level up to one. It's up to you. Again, you're the judge. That's the beauty of the game. Alignment functions on many levels, but there are two primary extremes. Lawful and chaotic, with the balance of neutrality in between. A character chooses one of three alignments at level zero. Law, neutral, or chaos. Th these are the forces in the universe. Good and evil exist within all creatures. Good and evil exist within all three alignments in equal measure. A, a highly consolidated force of lawful entities and people can do evil, evil things, uh, given the opportunity. It, it, it happens all the time in fantasy. It happens all the time in real life. Uh, and that's another thing that's beautiful about this game is it allows um, a philosophical debate of, of the merits of good and evil uh, for a group's given decision. Not a literary discussion on one of nine alignments and how your character should be forced to act. Uh, it literally lets it for it forces you to act as a player, not as much so as just a player character. Okay. All right, so let's talk now about experience point. Experience points and level and advancement. Uh, as characters complete adventuring, they practice their skill and become more talented. Characters earn experience points (XP) that allows them to progress in level. Basics of the XP system. DCC experience system works as follows. So this is why this is a funky experience system. Basics. Oh, yeah. 
all characters and classes use the same XP system. This is different from uh, the older school editions of Dungeons & Dragons. Each encounter is worth from 0 to 4 experience points, and those experience points are not earned by killing monsters, disarming traps, looting treasure, or completing a quest. Rather, successfully surviving encounters earned the character's XP in DCC. T a typical encounter is worth 2 XP, and the system scales from 0 to 4 depending on difficulty. So, uh, if you make it past the goblin guards at the beginning of the cave, you get two experience points. If you make it past the hallway of traps the goblins set up, you get two experience points. If you enter the dragon's horde and, like, grab a bronze coin, and then four of your party members are immediately incinerated, and you run out behind a tidal wave of melting iron and gold and silver and, like, uh, jewels and shit, you get four experience points. <laughs> it's not that hard. It, the, math is, the math works out. It's really easy. All characters that participate in the encounter receive the same XP. The judge determines how much XP is awarded. Characters level up when they reach the XP threshold for the next level. The, the level thresholds become progressively higher. The number of average adventures required to advance to each subsequent level is higher than the preceding level. So the way I have mathed this out is that for the most part, written adventures from Goodman Games, between 7 and 10 experience points. So... Use that as a basis for your own adventures. Like, if you're running a dungeon, don't don't give them more than 10. I I was all crazy. I gave I gave my players in Lankmar, like, uh, XP based on the number of enemies they fought one time. It was, like, 50, just to, like, boost them a little bit. Uh, I'm never doing that again. Uh, you know, again, you're the judge. You can make your own mistakes, but uh, this is the way the game recommends. Uh, see table 1 for the, for the amount of XP required to advance the level. We already seen it. Note, a first level character retains his hit points from level 0 and gains new hit points according to his class. All characters of first level or higher thus have their class hit die plus 1d4 hit points from level 0. And this is both modified by stamina, um, which is good. You know, you get you if you survive the level 0, you should you should have rollover hit points. That just makes sense. Some role-playing games codify game balance in an abundance of character options. This is all about the character creation funnel. The DCC RPG takes an anarchin anach anachronistic approach to this concept by pursuing an even playing field through randomization rather than complexity. The character creation steps that follow generate a play style that may be unlike anything you have experienced in the last 20 odd years provided you follow the steps precisely omit any any element and you'll find the process does not work here's why all right so this is, we're getting into some 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 highfalutin hyperbole here but it's true this is a system that works really good all together just it's a it's a it's a bowl it's a bolognese it's a zagna of an rpg system and if you want to like take out the magic system and put it in something else it's fine but uh you're going to be missing out on that cool martial uh attack system you're going to be missing out on some other cool stuff too so why don't you just keep it all why don't you just keep it all in one big uh big old lasagna why why you got to try to get the noodles out of the lasagna and put it on a dish next to a plate with some meat sauce. You know, I don't want a deconstructed lasagna. I want a big old, mmm, big old spicy lasagna. DCC RPG generates characters using what the author refers to as a funnel. First, each player generates at least two. Oh, goodness, what have I done? Ah! And possibly as many as four level zero characters. It is critical that the characters be generated using the process as described. Completely random ability scores, random occupations, random luck modifier, and random equipment. Each player ends up with an assortment of characters who could potentially serve as several different classes. When all characters are generated, players, the players go around the table and introduce their level 0 peons to their peers. 
unless you are a demi-human, in which case you are forced to play as one of the demi-human uh, race as classes. However, uh, I will sprinkle this little bit, tidbit of knowledge here into the 101 class for DCC RPG. Get the crawl zine. All issues to fully expand DCC RPG into something a little more, uh, how, how shall I say, a little complex, a little bit more of a complex dish than you might have originally anticipated here. Uh, the, the, the Crawl Zine is a balsamic vinaigrette to go on your delicious uh, role-playing game salad. You know, it's just going to tie it all together. Uh, it's going to add some uh, some elven thieves, some, some dwarven uh, priests, some halfling burglars, some halfling warriors, uh, just to flesh out those demi-humans a little bit, as well as cool rules for, for luck and weapons and, and taverns and just all kinds of crazy crap. Good stuff in the crawl zines. Uh, it's become almost canon within the community, uh, some of the stuff that, that is in there, so I highly recommend it. Next up, the funnel takes place in zero-level play. Um, during the first zero level game, it is expected each player will lose some or most of his characters. When mere peasants and yeomen dis explore deadly dungeons, a high mortality rate is a matter of course. By the end of the first game, the players will be left with a motley crew of survivors, and this group of heroic adventurers becomes the first level party. This is a really great way to start a campaign. This is a lot better way to start a campaign than you all meet in a dungeon. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it. We all love it. We've all done it. We've all been to that. In that. In that. I'm sorry. Did I say dungeon? I meant tavern. You all meet in a tavern. We've all been in that tavern. You all meet in the tavern. How about you all meet in the dungeon? You know. You. How, how about forty? Of you meet in the dungeon, and like six, of you all come back out, and we'll just you know whoever survives will come will come out the other side. You know, like that. That's that's what's good about this game. That's what makes this game great. Using this method of highly random character results, high mortality rate, and player choice as to which their randomly generated characters takes risks and which stays safe, you, the judge, will find you have a party of randomly generated characters in which the players have agency. There are essentially no opportunities for min-max play, and yet players find themselves attached to their plucky little serfs who have done such amazing deeds at low levels. Their zero-level exploits will define them forever with great deeds, completed at great risk. The author strongly encourages you to begin play using, using the method as described here exactly. Give it a chance. You may find that you like it. All true. It's so true that Level Zero Funnel is a great way to introduce people to role-playing games. It's a great way to introduce people to this role-playing game. Uh, it's a great way to kick off a funnel. It's a great uh, Zero session. It's it's great. It's not for everybody. Not everybody likes it. It's true. It's just it's a fact of life. I can't, uh, as much as I don't want it to be true, it is true. So what, what do you do? What do you do? Well... Here's another core rulebook, uh, not really a rulebook, it's a box set, it's the DCC Lonkmar set, and if you've played a D&D, you're probably familiar with the City of Adventure, the City of Seven Score Thousand Smokes, the City of the Black Toga, the City of Fafford and the Grey Mauser, Fritz Lieber's Lonkmar. It's awesome, it's it's great as a literary setting, it's even better as a role-playing game setting, if you don't ask, if you're asking me, I, lo I love it all, it's, it's great, I having a huge fun time running it. I'm sure some people are having a fun time watching me run it uh, in the DCC Lankmar or Solva Bauchicha adventures. No funnel in Lankmar. Uh, if you get that set, you get uh, expanded character options. Uh, still random, still Gonzo, still Motley Crew. Um, but yeah, it's a way to expand on that. And I, I'm not sure if Dying Earth is going to have different rules, but with each edition of the game, there's a different evolution of the game. Uh, and yeah, I, I do, I do definitely recommend checking out some of the other options if this funnel concept doesn't, doesn't, uh, mesh well with you, or if you do try it and you find you don't like it. There are other options with this role-playing game, because again, the funnel's amazing, but it's high-level play that really is where this game starts to shine. So let's start off here with the character classes now. At first level, humans may become clerics, thieves, warriors, or wizards. 
For elves, dwarves, and halflings, their race is synonymous with their class, unless you get crawl. The following information covers only the first two levels of each respective class, and particularly in the case of spellcasters, includes only a limited list of abilities and spells. For the fully expanded abilities of each class, or for higher level play than second, please reference the Dungeon Call Classics RPG rulebook. So, I'm not going to go in here and uh, one-to-one tell you what's missing and what is, uh, you know, present, but I will say this. In Dungeon Call Classics, the unlocking of additional abilities from your classes upon leveling is virtually non-existent. And by virtually, I mean it is unheard of. You do not unlock new things as you level up. You get better at the things you've always been good at. Sometimes exponentially so. Uh, But keep that in mind. You're not going to unlock a a cool... You don't unlock Turn Undead at level 5. You unlock Turn Undead at level 1. You get good at Turn Undead at level 5. You know, you, you you get... You 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 have the ability of doing a turn undead, you know, on a regular basis at level five. You know, you, you can try at level two, but uh, from my experience, it doesn't always really work uh, too great unless you're just trying to scatter some small uh, hit dice opponents. Anyway, we're moving on here. Clerics. Speaking of turn undead, an adventuring cleric is a militant servant of a god, often part of a larger order of brothers. He wields the weapon of his faith, physical, spiritual, and magical. Uh, The weapons of his faith, physical, spiritual, and magical. Physically, he's a skilled fighter when using his god's chosen weapon. Spiritually, he is a vessel for the expression of his god's ideas, able to channel holy powers that harm his god's enemies. Magically, he is able to call upon his god to perform amazing feats. All of these things are just basic features here from the cleric uh, within this game. Both clerics and wizards may gain powers from gods, but in different ways. A cleric worships a greater power and is rewarded for his service. A wizard unlocks hidden mysteries of the universe in order to dominate powers both known and unknowable. Hit points. Cleric gains a d8 hit points at each level. Alignment slash choosing a god at first level. Cleric selects a god to worship, and in doing so chooses one side of the eternal struggle. A cleric's choice of god must match his or her alignment. Weapon training. A cleric is trained in the weapons used by faithful followers of their god. The DCC core rulebook includes listing by deity for purposes of these quick start rules. Clerics can use the club may sling staff and warhammer. Clerics may wear any armor and their spell checks are not hindered by its use. I will say that I believe that those are the weapons that are considered holy to lawful deities. Um, I could be wrong, though. But yeah, you basically get different weapon training with every alignment uh, in the full rules, uh, which is always fun. Magic. A cleric can call upon the favor of his gods. This form of magic is known as idol magic. Its successful use allows a cleric to channel his god's power as a magical spell. A cleric has access to the spells of his god as noted in table 1-5. Uh, to cast a cleric make a... To class, cast a spell, a cleric makes a check. Uh, this check is a d20 plus personality modifier plus caster level. If the cleric succeeds, his god attends to his request. Not always predictably, but with positive results. The following rules apply to clerical or Idle magic. A natural one means disapproval. On a natural one, following a spell check, a cleric discovers that they have somehow gained the disapproval of their deity. The spell automatically fails, and the cleric must roll on table 5-7. Disapproval. See page 27. We'll get there when we get there, folks. Each failed check increases the chance of disapproval. After the first spell check fails in a day, a cleric's range of disapproval increases from a natural one to a natural roll of one or two. Thereafter, any natural roll of one or two, the spell automatically fails, and the cleric must roll on the disapproval table. After a second spell check fails, the cleric's range of disapproval increases uh, to a natural roll of one through three, and so on. The range continuous continues increasing, and any natural roll within that range automatically fails. This means that a cleric could potentially reach a point where 
normally successful roles automatically fail because they are in the disapproval range. For example, a cleric who fails 12 spell checks in a day would automatically fail any spell check on a roll of 1 to 13, even though a roll of 13 would normally mean success on first level clerical spells. When the cleric regains spells on the following day, his disapproval range is reset to a natural one, probably. Clerics who test their god may find they are not always forgiving. So again, you are the judge, you are the god, you make the call as to what uh, this disapproval range is going to be, and it does continuously go up. And I believe it doesn't say so here, but in my games... Uh, the disapproval table is pretty big, and you actually roll a d4 on that table for every point of disapproval that you had. So if you've got that 13, you know, because you failed 12 points, you failed 12 spells, and you get, you, get that thir you get a 13, you roll that 12, you know? You roll 13 d4 on the table, and you could end up, like, unable to talk for a week like it's some cra pretty crazy stuff we'll get there when we get there but uh let's keep going sacrifices sacrifices a cleric may make sacrifices to his deity in order to regain favor sacrifices may according sacrifices vary according to the nature of the deity but in general any offering of material wealth counts other acts and blah blah blah, blah, blah. i'm sorry Sacrifices vary according to the nature of the deity, but in general, any offering of material wealth counts. Other acts may count as well at the discretion of the judge. Sacrificing wealth means the item must be burned, melted down, donated to the needy, contributed to a temple, or otherwise relieved from the character's possession. They may be donated as part of a special rite, or simply added to a temple's coffers. This is not a rapid combat action. It requires a minimum time of at least one turn of the cleric's full concentration boom what's a turn a turn is 10 minutes a round is 10 seconds this is the time timekeeping the dcc uses that, that's it end of end of definition for every 50 gold points of sacrifice good the cleric cancels one point of normal disapproval range for example, a disapproval range of 1 through 4 can be reduced to a 1 through 3 range. Uh, a natural 1 still counts as an automatic failure in disapproval. A great deed, quest, or service to a deity may also count as sacrifice at the judge's discretion. So that's if you really piss off your god. Now you've got to go on like a big old quest to just get to use magic again. It, it can happen. Um, next up, turn unholy talked about this before cleric wields his holy symbol to turn away abominations at any time a cleric may utilize a spell check to deter unholy creatures an unholy creature is any being that the cleric scriptures declare unholy typically this includes undead demons and devils the turn unholy spell check is made as follows 1d20 plus personality modifier plus caster level plus luck modifier failure increases disapproval range as noted above so it's just like another spell but you're turning, there's a table, it tells you what the effects are, it can smite them, it's all crazy stuff, it's very gonzo. Lay on hands. Clerics heal the faithful by making a spell check. A cleric may lay on hands to heal damage to any living creature. The cleric may not heal undead, animated objects, living stat like living statues, extraplanar creatures like demons, devils, or elementals, or constructs, uh, e.g. golems. In this manner, the cleric must physically touch the wounds of the faithful and concentrate for one action. Uh, this can happen during one round, so you can uh, combat action and then a move. The spell check is made uh, as any other 1d20 plus personality modifier plus caster level. Failure increases disapproval range as previously noted. Healing via laying on hands is always accomplished in terms of the subject's own hit dice and is bound by alignment. Specific conditions such as disease, paralysis, or poison may be healed instead of general damage if the hit die results are high enough. See core book. Uh, so there you go. Uh, spell check of 1 through 11 is a failure across the board. And yes, this does your alignment does matter here. Uh, if you're lawful, then you are counted as... Uh, if you're lawful trying to heal somebody who's awful, also lawful, then you use the same chart. 
You know, you get automatically success. If success is automatically going to do two hit dice to that person, even if it's a lawful thief, uh, you will heal them for 2d6. Uh, d6 is the hit dice for a thief. Um, if you're adjacent, which is like one over, so usually neutral. Um, neutral is great for a cleric because uh, everybody is either same or adjacent to you. Uh, only lawful or chaotic uh, clerics are opposed. Uh, you know, oh, you know, on, only if you are lawful or chaotic do you have an opposed potential of people who are opposed to you, who it's going to be harder for you to heal. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with your party makeup of like what your alignments are and like what the cleric's alignment is. Uh, and it makes more sense to have a neutral cleric than it does anything else. But there's fewer neutral deities in DCC than any other kind. So I think that might be part of uh, the way the game is uh, meant to function. The cleric's alignment further influences the result. If cleric and subject are the same alignment, they count as same on the table. If cleric and subject differ in alignment by one step, e.g. one is neutral and the other is lawful or chaotic, or have different but not antithetical gods, they count as adjacent. Oh, I didn't realize that. So even if you're both lawful, you count as adjacent if you have different, different gods. Such a healing action may constitute sin if not done in service of the faith. If clerics and subjects are of opposed alignment, e.g. one is lawful and one is chaotic, or have rival gods, they count as opposed on the table. Such a healing almost always counts as a sin, unless it is an extraordinary event in the service of a deity. So that's a little bit different from the way I'm remembering it in the core rulebook being written, but, like, I love that. Yeah, like, it's... Say you're gonna get you, you can heal, but I'm giving you disapproval for it. You get a point of disapproval for every for every hit dice you heal, uh, or something something crazy like that. Yeah, like that that could be very interesting. Um, we're gonna move on here to the thief now. Moving on, we got the thief. Thieves include hulking, skulking thugs waiting for their next victim. Dexterous wall-climbing burglars, brazenly pilfering treasures from impenetrable vaults. Fleet-footed cut purses, outrunning shouting pursuers through a crowded market. Or brooding killers stalking difficult prey. Thieves can be big or small, fast or slow, tall or thin, but they have all one thing in common. They survive not by sword or spell, but by stealth and cunning. A thief gains 1d6 points. 1d6 hit points at each level, that's the hit points. Weapon training, thieves are trained in these weapons. Black jacks, blow guns, crossbows, daggers, darts, garrotes, long sword, short sword, sling, and staff. Thieves are careful in their choice of armor as it affects their use of their skills. This is true, every armor comes with a check penalty. This applies to your thief skills. Most of these weapons, not all, but most, daggers and garrote especially, most notably, have increased damage thresholds for you if you are sneaking. A garrote does one point of damage under normal circumstances, but it does like 3d4 or 4d4. Um, yeah, I think 3d4 damage, uh, which is just 3 to 12 damage is insane uh, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's the best damage threshold in the game. Um, on top of that, you automatically crit, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Alignment. Although thieves have little regard for the laws of civilization, they are not always necessarily chaotic. This is true. Uh, they have a score progression for each alignment. Thieves can't. Thieves can't just speak one language because they know the, the language thieves can't. Uh, thieves speak a secret language called the can't, known only to members of their class. This is a spoken language with no written alphabet. Teaching the can't to a non-thief is punishable by death. Certain double entendre phrases in common have an alternative meaning in the can't and are used by thieves to identify their brethren covertly. As a judge, I use... Cockney 
which was created uh, in in uh, Victorian England, uh, so that the uh, peasants uh, living in you know Whitechapel and the other like terrible neighborhoods in London uh, of the time. Um, sure, Whitechapel's not too bad to live in now, but, 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 but beside the point. Uh, the point is here that um, they would use uh, like this weird rhyming slang called Cockney that you can look up. There's a really good. Uh, uh, like Wikipedia of all the Cockney terms, both classic and new. Uh, and it, it works really well at the table as a RPG thing. Um, I don't force my players to learn it, but uh, I use it to inform uh, Thieves Cant when I do want to use it. Luck and Wits. Thieves survive on their luck and wits, uh, and the most successful thieves live a life of fortune on guts and intuition. A thief gains additional bonuses... Blah, blah, blah. A thief gains addi additional bonuses when expending luck. Uh, so first, the thief rolls a luck die when they expend luck. The luck die is indicated on table 1-6 for each point of luck expended. They roll one die uh, and apply that modifier to their roll. For example, a second level thief who burns two points of luck adds 2d4 to a d20 roll. Second, Unlike other classes, the thief recovers lost luck to a limited extent. A thief's luck score is restored each night by a number of points equal to their level. This process cannot take their luck score past its natural maximum. So this is a very interesting. Uh, this is a very interesting thing. Any class can burn luck at a one-to-one -one ratio, but as a thief, each level brings you further up the dice chain on that bonus that you get. Uh, so currently in Lockmar, one of my players is a third level thief and rolls a d5 uh, every time they burn a luck point. So if they're if they're ten points away, that might only mean that they need to roll two uh, two d5, you know, two luck points if they're really lucky. But uh, that's a story for another time. Uh, let's keep going down here. The thief skills. So. Most classes in DCC receive no skills. There are no skills in DCC. In fact, uh, your level 0 occupation is your implied skill list. If you can argue that you would be good at something, you get a d20. If you can't, you roll a d10. That's the basic mechanic of how that works, but uh, you can expand on that as you wish. Uh, a thief learns certain skills that aid their illicit pursuits. A thief can pick locks, find and disable traps, sneak silently, hide in shadows, climb sheer surfaces, forage documents, pick pockets, handle poison, and read languages. Uh, a thief's alignment determines the rate of advancement in the various thieving skills. Uh, the thief receives a bonus to their skills based on level and alignment as shown on table 1-6. To use a thief's skill, the player rolls d20, adds their modifier. They must beat a dc assigned to the task at hand. An easy task is DC 5, while an extremely difficult task is DC 20. I explained uh, how difficulty classes worked earlier in the video, uh, but yeah, if you need a refresher, that's pretty much the thresholds there. For example, picking an extraordinary well-crafted lock or picking the pocket of an alerted guard, in some cases the judge may make the roll for the character, and the result will not be known until some trigger event occurs, e.g. forged document may not truly be tested until presented to the king's commissary so what that is saying here is um if you're if you're actively trying to stab somebody we're gonna roll that right now or you're trying to do something right now but if you're gonna forge a document or you're gonna uh, create a disguise that's not going to be tested until it encounters someone who's going to like be tested by it or be you know uh, experience, they're going to experience this uh, forged document or this disguise or whatever, that's when the check is rolled, not necessarily before. Um, a thief needs special tools to pick locks, find and disable traps, climb sheer surfaces, forge documents, and handle poisons. A first level thief must pursue, must purchase a set of thieves tools that allow them to use these skills. Success when using a thieves skill means the following. Um, so we're going to go through these briefly. Uh, backstab, the most successful thieves kill without their victim ever being aware of the threat. This is true in most role-playing games, but especially in DCC. When attacking a target from behind or when the target is otherwise unaware, the thief receives an indicated attack bonus to their attack roll. 
In addition, if they hit, the thief automatically achieves a critical hit. Rolling on the critical hit table as per their level, backstab attempts can only be made against creatures with clear anatomical vulnerabilities. So, that's left purposefully vague. I'll let you argue amongst yourselves what that means. What do you think that means? Uh, give me a tell. Tell me in the comment section below. Sneak silently. The thief rolls hard a against a hard DC, and success means the thief did indeed sneak silently. With the exception of demigods and extraordinary magic, the thief's movement cannot be hurt. Uh, the base DC for moving across stone surfaces is DC 10. Cushion surfaces such as grass or carpet are five. Moderately noisy surfaces such as creaking wood boards are DC 15, and extremely noisy surfaces like cracking leaves, still water, or crunchy gra gravel are a DC 20. So keep that in mind in your dungeons. Um, it could be very interesting here. Hide in shadows. A successful. I also here's something else. I wasn't aware that it was a. Uh, <clears throat> Described as a hard DC. I've been kind of doing that differently in my games if you've been watching, and I will change that now that I've read this. It's kind of the reason I wanted to make this video series uh, is so that I could go through and, and read all of this uh, myself, and even aloud, uh, and, and have a discussion with it amongst the people who watch my content. Uh, hide in Shadows. A successful Hide in Shadows check means the thief cannot be seen. The base DC for sneaking down a hallway with moderate cover, chairs, bookcases, crevices, nooks, and crannies, alcoves, is 10. Hiding at night or in a shaded or dimly lit area is DC 5. Hiding under a full moon is DC 10. Hiding in broad daylight, but in a dark shadow or behind a solid object is DC 15. And hiding in broad daylight with minimal obstruction is DC 20. But again, is allowed to be attempted. Here's another... Really cool illustration of a big old scorpion sneaking up on the sarcophagus there. It looks like somebody's in, in for a bad time, and looks like I'm in for a bad time. It's like, oh, oh no, we're gonna do a quick pause. All right, here's the next. Here's the next uh, sections, and then we'll get to the table. Pickpocket. The thief surreptitiously takes an object off of a target's person. This skill also includes other feats of legendary domain, such as card tricks, minor magic tricks, and so on. Ooh, goodness me. Oh, I know. Yep, we gotta wrap this up here pretty soon. Um, stealing from the una an unaware target with a loose pocket and an unsecured coin pouch is DC5. Picking the pocket of a target that is actively watching and monitoring his or her belongings is DC20. And the varying degree of watchfulness in between define other check thresholds. Uh, so again, they're not going to tell you every single uh, situation here, but they give you the thresholds to give you an idea. Uh, 5 to 20, again. Climb sheer surface, as one would expect. DC 20 is perfectly smooth surface with no visible handholds. A normal stone wall is DC 20. A mundane lock is DC 10. An extremely well-crafted lock is DC 20 for pick lock. Uh, some locks of legendary manufacture and notable difficulty are DC 25 or higher. Um, you can find a lot of those in Lonkmar. Um, here we go. Find and disable trap. A large, bulky trap is DC 10. This would include traps like a pit in the floor, a spring-loaded axe, or a dropped portacle. Porticolus, I think. Um, more subtle traps are DC 15, DC 20, or even higher. A natural one on a disarmed trap check triggers the trap. Uh, forged documents. The DC varies on the complexity and originality of the source document ranging from DC 5 to DC 20. Again, disguise self. The degree of change determines the DC. The thief can transform themselves to resemble someone of the same basic race and physical dimensions with DC 5 check. Changing significant facial features requires a DC 10 check. Changing physical traits like mannerisms and height requires DC 15 check. To fool someone close to the target, such as parent or spouse, it's going to require a DC 20 check. Alright, let's move my uh, head out of the way here. Read languages. Interpreting simple meaning requires a DC 10 check. Interpreting anything more detailed is DC 15 or above. 
Handle poison. Anytime a thief uses poison, they must make a DC 10 safety check. On a failure, they accidentally poison themselves. This check is made each time poison is applied to a blade or other surface. Additionally, a natural one on any attack roll with a poison blade, the thief automatically poisons themselves in addition to any fumble results. Good to know. Very good to know. So let's um, read the final thief skill. Cast from scroll. Provided a spell is written on a scroll, a thief can attempt to read that scroll and cast the magical spell. The spell check DC is as standard, but the thief rolls the indicated type of die attempted uh, to attempt to beat the DC. The thief may not attempt to spell burn on this action. So this is in reference to, let's go over here. These tables for the thief. Here's your cleric leveling matrix for levels 1 to 2. Um, it'll let you know. You know, you get 4 level 1 spells, 5 level 1 spells. Uh, depending on when you're level 1 or 2, you get some different titles like Acolyte or Heathen Slayer. Neutral, Chaotic gives you some different titles. Thief gives you some titles as well. Uh, you have your crit die and your crit table. Those are important if you ever roll a 20. Uh, your attack bonus, usually the same for all classes or somewhere like it, as well as your fortitude, reflex, and will saving throws. Uh, and any other features your class may have is going to show up in what we call a leveling matrix. It's a chart you use to tell you where your character should be uh, in any given level. Uh, naturally, each level you get a certain number of hit points. Uh, equal to your hit die plus stamina, you know so on and so forth so here we go on this this is a little oh, this is a little funky to read but this is this is the real deal here for thieves and then i'll give you my final my final thoughts on what we've read so far uh before i sign off you got your lawful if you're a lawful thief this is your skill progression for these skills if you're neutral you have this skill progression for these skills, you kind of have to go level one and level two, figure out what level you are and kind of like follow it over and then figure out what alignment you are as well. Uh, this is to make some very different thieves. A, a mafia thief is going to be real different. Uh, like a lawful mafia thief is going to be real, real different from like a chaotic assassin thief. You know what I mean? They're going to have different skills. They're going to have different uh, experiences and stuff. And there's even rules in one of the crawl zines for creating your own skill progression chart for the thief which i uh even like using even more because some of that stuff doesn't make uh as much sense for certain things uh, just another another additional level of uh customization here for your thieves um yeah we are uh i i guess i do want to say like this i i'm sorry for not getting through the whole thing in one in one go i thought i would have more time or not that i didn't think i would have more time i didn't think it would take so long for me to do all this uh it seemed like it would be a Real quick read. Um, I got a lot of respect for people who do audiobooks right now. Um, but I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to do another one of these. Uh, we're going to continue to read this uh, this book because I want to introduce more people to it. I want more people to uh, to understand why Dungeon Crawl Classics is a really cool role playing game. And I know that uh, my Green screen's not looking real great right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick sign off. And, uh, you know, thank you all for watching. Uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Give me a follow if you've been watching on Twitch. I don't think I've got too many Twitch viewers uh, coming at me currently. Uh, yeah, no, nothing, in the, nothing in the chat right now. But if you're, as always, if you're on YouTube, give me a comment. Uh, ask me something. I'll always answer it uh, in the coming series uh of me reading through the rest of this book and go, going through the rest of the classes and giving some a little bit of advice here and there and how you can uh, expand uh on what's here in the the freebie guide uh mainly by just picking up the core rule book it's really not that uh that expensive my my copy was uh, 25 bucks uh and it is a it's bigger it's bigger than a fifth edition rule book bigger than a fifth edition module and those are really thick yeah this is uh 480 something pages or just about um definitely recommend it it's worth it's worth the money dungeon crawl classics is my favorite role-playing game 
Uh, and I'm confident that if you give it a, a genuine shot, you try some of the just beyond beyond just the funnel, but the the higher level play as well, and even the campaign play. Uh, that this this system is going to have a really special place in your heart as well if you give it a chance. So thank you again as always. I've been Zach Lane, aka Judge Z, aka Zacharias the Pious, the House Lane, first of his name, former Lord of Give a Shit a Sheer, Harbinger of Sass, and Holy Prince of the Sea of Ash, and Lord of the Game. And today that game has been the only game whose maze craze plays for days in ways that will amaze days and set characters ablaze. Dungeon Crawl Classics. Have yourself a good week at the table, everybody.